Hi, everyone. Welcome to this evening's virtual event. I'm so excited to be joining you. My name is Carell Centers, and I'm the events director at Bookshop Santa Cruz. And we're so thrilled to be welcoming Omar Alakhed tonight in conversation with Lauren Markham. Um, I'm not at Bookshop right now, but um, we have long wanted to host Omar, um, and we're so thrilled to be celebrating the release today of What Strange Paradise. Um, at Bookshop, our community is vital to us locally, nationally, and even globally. And it's because of your continued patronage that we're still here in the midst of this ongoing crisis of this global pandemic. As a values-driven independent bookstore, we hope the world we all return to looks different from the one we left behind. And we see these talks as a way to deepen and refresh in order to resume the vital work that is before us. We're so grateful to you for spending your resources and your evening with us, and we hope you find both refuge and inspiration here tonight. So tonight we are so thrilled to be welcoming Omar and Lauren to our screens for a conversation about What Strange Paradise. Um, we'll have a conversation and a reading about the book and then open up for audience questions. But before we get started, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of Crowdcast, our um, event platform, so that you feel comfortable navigating here tonight. To the right side of your screen is a chat field. You are welcome to use that field to share thoughts and engage with your community tonight. Um, you can let us know where you're joining, from, joining us from if you'd like to. If you find it distracting, you can hide it by clicking the arrow at the top right of that field and that will collapse that area. So we'll just carry on without you. For audience questions tonight, you're going to find those by clicking on the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen. You can submit questions anytime as this talk is underway. You can view and upvote other people's questions um, and we will get to those later in the evening. So please uh, go ahead and fill that up so that we have lots of time to talk about audience questions tonight as well. Uh, the event is being recorded so you can watch it and share it with friends if you wanna relive any particular moments or you can't um, write down your favorite notes fast enough, no worries. You can just replay the event shortly after it concludes. Um, it'll be right here on this exact same screen. I definitely encourage you to buy the book if you have not already done so. Your purchase supports local jobs and independent culture, and it shows the publisher that our audience is invested and engaged in Santa Cruz. So thank you so much for your purchase. Also want to thank everyone that has donated to tonight's event. If you'd like to make a donation, you can click the donate button on the bottom of your screen as well. Every dollar helps us to keep our events program going strong. So thank you so much for all of your generous donations. We do have a couple of great events coming up down the road. Um, I, I don't have time to tell you about all the ones that I hope you will come back and join us for. Um, but a couple of highlights are a ticketed virtual event with Sandra Cisneros for her new novel on September 8th. And we also have a couple of fantastic new memoirs um, from Kat Chow and Chan Julie Wang this month and next month. So definitely check out our full calendar listing. Follow us on Crowdcast to stay tuned. Um, I'll put some links in the chat for that as well. But tonight we have Omar al Aked. He is an author and a journalist. He has reported from Afghanistan, Guantanamo Bay, and many other locations around the world. His work earned Canada's National Newspaper Award for Investigative Journalism and the Goff Penny Award for Young Journalists. His writing has appeared in The Guardian, Le Monde, Guernica, GQ, and many other newspapers and magazines. His debut novel, American War, is an international bestseller and has been translated into 13 languages. It won the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association Award, the Oregon Book Award for Fiction, and the Kobo Emerging Writer Prize, and it has been nominated for more than 10 other awards. I just want to take a moment to let that sink in because, wow. <laughs> it was also listed as one of the best books of the year by the New York Times, the Washington Post, GQ, NPR, and Esquire, and was selected by the BBC as one of the 100 novels that shaped our world. So if you haven't picked up your copy of his first book yet, you can also do that on our website. Tonight, Omar will be in conversation with Lauren Markham. Lauren is a writer based in California whose work has appeared in outlets such as Guernica, Harper's, Lit Hub, 
Best American Travel Writing, The New Republic, The New York Review of Books, The New York Times Magazine, and VQR, where she is a contributing editor. Lauren is the author of The Faraway Brothers, Two Young Migrants and the Making of an American Life, which was awarded the Northern California Book Award, the California Book Award Silver Medal, and the Hour Prize. In addition to writing, she works at a high school for newcomer youth in Oakland, California, that she helped fund in 2007. And I'm so thrilled to be welcoming them both to our screen. Give me one second. <laughs> Confession, my seating arrangements drastically changed as I started this event. So sorry about the topsy-turvy there. Go ahead and bring Lauren and Omar to our screens. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here, both of you. I'm so thrilled for your conversation. Um, as mentioned, I will be down here in the corner watching and enjoying, and I will join you um, towards the end of the evening to close everything out. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karel. Hi, Omar. How are you? How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? It is very hot mm. where you are. It is. Last I checked, it was 101. Um, wow, in the evening. That's horrible. Yes, it is horrible. It's it's horrible on, on two fronts. It's horrible just on a, on a sort of human survival front, uh, but also because um, I grew up in the Middle East. So this is like spring for me, um, but the rest of my family is sort of sweltering. Um, Melting. I feel very bad that they did not marinate in the Middle East to be to be resigned. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, what is it like in, in the Bay Area right now? I'm very sorry to say, uh, just it's lovely. <laughs> I mean, it's it's lovely for me, and I'm sorry to say for you. We should we should all say it's not like Omar's in Florida or something. He's in the Pacific Northwest, so it should not be 101 degrees there. It's not like oh, rough time of year. It's like rough world. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. First of all, I want to say that. Um, for those of you who don't know the Far Away Brothers, please, please pick it up. Um, in fact, if you're going to pick up one book tonight, make it that one. It's just brilliantly written. Uh, if you're going to pick up two books, also pick up mine. That would be fantastic. But um, Far Away Brothers is a, is a marvel. It's a really brilliantly written book. Um, thank you for doing this. It means a lot. It is such an honor to be here. And um, I'm going to take the reins back because absolutely not. We are here to celebrate. It's just like completely astounding book. And um, I, you know, I got it special mailed to me and sort of like, uh, but devoured it, but not in the sort of fast page turning way, even, even though it's a book that, 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 that moves quite swiftly. Like it also just demands a lot of attention and a lot of contemplation and a lot of sort of like staring into space and letting things sink in. I had dreams about the characters. Um, it was just like this, this book um, has populated my consciousness for the past couple of weeks. So it's a total honor to be here. And Omar, you're, you're this book. I I'm, I'm so happy to be talking about this and everyone needs to buy this book and his last book. Um, but let's first start. I would like, it would be really great to just hear this book for folks who've read it or folks who are about to read it or in the middle of it, like to hear, I would love to hear this in your voice. So could you, Give us a little a taste of what what this what this sounds like to you. Sure. Um, apologies in advance if I just out of reflex start reciting um, the famous children's book "Mr. Brown Can Moo Can You" um, <laughs> because my toddler is going through a Mr. Brown phase, and I read that book at least thirty or forty times in rapid succession today, which. If my voice goes, or that's why. Um, yes. So this is a book called What Strange Paradise. Um, it's a repurposed fairy tale. It's it's the story of Peter Pan repurposed as as the story of a contemporary child refugee. Uh, it's told in alternating chapters. Uh, we start with a child who washes up on the shore of a of an unnamed Western island, um, and uh, oh, somebody writes kids books in the in the audience. That is a talent that is um, so far beyond me. Um, <laughs> I, that's more power to you. Um, so we start with um, with this child who's who's the sole survivor of a migrant shipwreck. He washes up on the shores of a Western island, and um, the chapters alternate between what happens once he gets there, and so those are the after chapters, and then the before chapters describing how he got there in the first place. Um, so this is just the opening page of the book. The child lies on the shore. All around him, the beach is littered with the wreckage of the boat and the wreckage of its passengers. Shards of decking, 
knapsacks cleaved and gutted, bodies frozen in unnatural contortion. Dispossessed of nightfall's temporary burial, the dead ferment in decency. There's too much of spring in the day, too much light. Face down with his arms outstretched, the child appears from a distance as though playing at flight. And so too in the bodies that surround him, though distended with seawater and hardening, there flicker the remnants of some silent levitation, a severance from the laws of being. The sea is tranquil now, the storm is past. The island, despite the debris, is calm. A pair of plump orange-necked birds, stragglers from a northbound flock, take rest on the lamppost from which hangs one end of a police cordon. In the breaks between the wailing of the sirens and the murmur of the onlookers, they can be heard singing. The species is not unique to the island, nor the island to the species, but the birds, when they stop here, change the pitch of their songs. The call is an octave higher, a sharp, throat-scraping thing. In time, a crowd gathers near the site of the shipwreck, tourists and locals alike. People watch. The eldest of them, an arthritic fisherman driven in recent years by plummeting cherubfish stalks to kitchen work at a nearby resort, says that it's never been like this before on the island. Other locals nod because even though the history of this place is that of violent endings, of galleys flipped over the axes of their oars and fishing skiffs tangled in their own netting, and once during the war, an empty Higgins lander sheared to ribbons by shrapnel, the old man is still in his own way right. These are foreign dead. No one can remember exactly when they first started washing up along the eastern coast, but in the last year it has happened with such frequency that many of the nations on whose tourists the island's economy depends have issued travel advisories. The hotels and resorts, in turn, have offered discounts. Between them, the Coast Guard and the morgue keep a partial count of the dead, and as of this morning, it stands at 1,026, but this number is as much an abstraction as the dead themselves are to the people who live here, to whom all the shipwrecks of the previous year are a single shipwreck, all the bodies a single body. Three officers from the municipal police force pull a long strip of caution tape along the breadth of the walkway that leads from the road to the beach. Another three wrestle with large sheets of blue boat cover canvas, trying to build a curtain between the dead and their audience. In this way, the destruction takes on an air of queer unreality, a stage play bled of movement, a fairy tale upturned. The officers, all of them young and impatient, manage to tether the fabric to a couple of lampposts from which the orange-necked birds whistle and flee. But even stretched and near tearing, the canvas does little to hide the dead from view. Some of the onlookers shuffle awkwardly to the far end of the parking lot, where there's still an acute line of sight between the draping and four television news trucks. Others climb on top of parked cars and sweep their cameras across the width of the beach, some with their backs to the carnage, their own faces occupying the center of the recording. The dead become the property of the living. Oriented as they are, many of the shipwrecked bodies appear to have been spat up landward by the sea, or of their own volition to have walked out from its depths and then collapsed a few feet later. Except the child. Relative to the others, he is inverted. His head closest, closest to the lapping waves, his feet nestled into the warmer, lighter sand that remains dry even at highest tide. He is small, but somewhere along the length of his body marks the sea's farthest reach. A wave brushes gently against the child's hair. He opens his eyes. Thank you. Um, God, your prose is so alive and magnetic. And um, I was actually gonna start with another question, but, but just because we got to hear this sort of beauty and um, particularness and aliveness and, and sharpness, and it's both like sharp and watery at once. I think that's the, 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 the um, you know, the precision of your description combined with, with your lyricism. And so one of the things I wanted to just ask about is, how you manage to write so beautifully about such horrific things and create and, and, and kind of hold that balance of beautiful prose about about horror. Uh, thank you so much for that. That's very kind. That's that's much more generous than I deserve. I um, um, uh, for better or worse, I, I just as a writer generally, I, I tend to live at the sentence level. Mm -hmm. um, you, you sort of chisel away at these things. Um, uh, 
trying for something. Um, and, and it's one of those, it's a very quantum thing. You look at it and it goes away. Um, and you have to sort of reach it by accident. Um, there's one paragraph in the entire book where I felt like I was in the place. Um, and, and, um, that's like, it's, I, it sounds like a poor batting average, but I'll take that. You know, I'll take one paragraph a novel of, of sort of, <laughs> I was there. I was, I don't know how I got there. I don't know how to get back, but I was there for one paragraph. Totally. Um, it's, I think part of it is that I spent, I spent 10 years as a journalist. Um, and and um, I, one of the things, I mean, I don't need to tell you this, but, but you can, um, you can give yourself a lot of crutches through the, 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 the sort of pre-research and research and, and sort of building before, before you actually, the blueprinting, I guess, before you actually build the damn thing. Mm -hmm. And f again, for better or worse, What Strange Paradise has a lot of blueprints. Structurally, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff going on in terms of how I constructed it. Um, so, you know, I think there's that famous Ursula Le Guin quote, you know, I know what I'm doing and why. Um, I can only presume to half of that. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing, but I know why. I'm doing, I have good reasons. So when you build the load bearing beams in such a way that they can hold the damn thing, you're a little more comfortable than sort of putting stuff on top of the load bearing beam. So in this case, a lot of it is structured around the two stories in the epigraph. Mm -hmm. um, there are two quotes on the epigraph page. One is from the original Peter Pan and the other is from a short story called An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. Um, and depending on how familiar you are with those two pieces of source material, this is this reads like a very different book. Um, the first four people who read it, the first four people who read the manuscript had four entirely different interpretations of what the hell was happening, uh, which again, it's a short book. It's not, you know, um, it's not American War, which is this big kitchen sink thing. Um, and so I, I do a lot of that ahead of time so that I can sort of live at the sentence level. Um, and come up with, you know, when it works, it works. And when it doesn't, it's very purple and kind of, you know, needed 13 less adjectives and, you know, that sort of thing. But, um, but that's generally how I, how I sort of operate. That's um, such a lovely answer. I love what you're saying about load bearing beams. And I'm co totally going to um, quote you on that with my students, um, because it's so true when you kind of create a structure, then, then there's actually more room rather than it's not, you know, one could imagine that a structure could confine, but it's actually kind of liberating. Um, I, I want to be hesitant to not do like total, I'm, I'm going to tend toward like doing prose craft, like nerd fest, but, but I want to get to actually your, the kind of, yeah, which I know we can, we can do some of that, but I want to kind of back up a little bit. Um, you mentioned that you were a journalist and um, I wanted to, you know, I, 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 it's perfect segue because I wanted to talk about um, how your work, well, first of all, I want to talk about the kind of conception of this book and, and the, your, your sort of story of, of your own story of, of coming to this as a story. Um, so I want to, actually, how about I'll start with that and I'll ask the journalism question after that. Um, yeah, so so um, you, you get to sort of, um, one of the fun things about writing novels, you get to come up with a mythology after the fact and the sort of Genesis story and the very clean, like, you know, this happened, this happened, I wrote a book. There's an epiphany, a, a completely ordered arc in which exactly. this all happened in my life, yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was sitting outside an apple tree and a narrative fell on my head. And, you know, it was, um, the, the, what I'm going with, with this one, which again, it's all very messy and, and it's not, but, but the two sort of events that come to me as, as a sort of starting points for thinking about the things that eventually congealed into this novel. The first was in 2012. I was back in Egypt. Uh, I was born in Egypt. I grew up in the middle East. Um, and, and, uh, I was back there as a journalist. I was covering the aftermath of the Arab Spring, and I was riding around with an old high school buddy of mine who was complaining about rent. Rent is too high. The rent is too high. And at one point, I asked him, "So, okay, so what's what's the rent for like uh, an apartment in your building, for example?" And he said, "Well, do you mean the locals' price or do you mean the Syrians' price?" And I said, "Well, what the hell's the Syrians' price?" And he said, "Well, we've been having this influx of people who had to come down here." And uh, they have no choice. What are they going to do? You can charge them three times as much. Are they going to go? You know, what are they going to do? Go back? Um, and it quickly became clear that this was sort of standard operating procedure, not just for rents, but also when you went down to the fruit and vegetable stall down the street to buy, you know, mangoes mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, and this is in the context of, you know, if I was born a few years earlier, I would also be Syrian. It used to be one country, like, and then all this sort of pan-Arab, you know, all these Arab leaders talking about our Syrian brothers and sisters. And, and so it was all bullshit and, and it meant nothing. Uh, at the end of the day, there was a population that could be exploited 
and it was going to be exploited. Hmm. Um, and so I was thinking about that. And um, a while after that, I was reading a story of, of um, a migrant shipwreck that had happened in the Mediterranean. And, and the details of the story were, were fairly horrific. And, and in, in hindsight, what, what sort of struck me oh, a little while later was how it inspired, the story inspired this immense outrage in this part of the world mm-hmm. for about 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And then everybody moved on. It was sort of, that's the privilege of being here is that you can be outraged and be a good progressive who gets outraged at the right thing and then move on and be outraged at the right, next right thing and so on and so forth. And so the book is essentially from a sort of manifesto point of view, which is maybe the least interesting part of any novel, but but like it's oriented against that idea of, of instantaneous forgetting, against this idea of it being good enough to um, and I don't want to criticize. I know that this is kind of like a psychic self-defense. We, we get, we get, you know, these these horrible things happening. It's a cascade. But I wanted to write against this this privilege of just being outraged temporarily and then moving on. And it also seems to me it, it's it's sort of um, a, a a request for part- or kind of a call to particularity. Um, because another thing that happens with with these horrors is a outrage and then forgetting, but also like they all start to blend together. You know what I mean? Like the this horrific shipwreck and that horrific shipwreck and that horrific shipwreck. And like one could be forgiven actually for like not, I mean, I can't even keep the fires in California straight. The ones who smoke, I have breathed into my body. You know, the, and, and so the, 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 you were spending time in on one ship and with one particular person, um, which, which seems to me again, um, sort of this ethical call uh, and reminder toward the particularity of these, you know, catastrophic losses and that they don't sort of just get subsumed into some mass kind of overwhelming um i don't know like yeah uh horror cloud yeah i mean i i think you know this far better than i do right like you're fighting against that but you're also you're cognizant of how powerful a force that is right um you know the the but the, the obvious image that starts this book has, has prompted a lot of people for, for, again, for obvious reasons to think of a particular image uh, from real life or this, you know, depending on where you are in the world, I've had a couple quoted back at me. Mm-hmm. Um, but the one I've had it quoted, the, I've had quoted back at me most often was, oh, I don't remember their name, but, but, you know, you know what I'm talking, you know, and, and again, I don't, I'm not, I'm not out I don't think people go into this with that kind of malicious sense of like, who cares right. about those people? It's just right. that there's no consequences to not caring. And, right. and so sure. you're in the novel form, which, you know, whether I do it well or badly is, is like setting that aside. This is where you dwell. You go yes. to the novel right. to dwell. That's kind right. of, yes. you know, more than any other form, more than any other medium. Um, and so that's what I wanted to do. I mm. wanted to, I wanted to dwell. Um, what that, what happens on the other side of that, what the reader does, uh, you know, if they use that, if they use that as a jumping off point to do anything else, that's entirely up to them. But mm. I think I'm asking them to just sort of mm. not look away for a little bit. Mm. Um, well, I think you do it so beautifully. And again, just sort of the way you manage to, um, and I want to talk a little bit about this, you know, more specifically on like the level of the line and, and, and particular moments in the text, but the way that you are able um, to be in sort of a space of like a, abundant humanity and beauty and horror all at the same time um, just strikes me as a, a profoundly difficult balance um, to, to, to strike and one that I just, I just um, am in awe of. I, I, it strikes me too, like, especially with your, uh, you know, past life and perhaps future life. I don't know. Have you given up journalism? Is journalism, is it over? <laughs> no, who knows? No. Yeah. I still, yeah. I still do it. Uh, still just as badly as I used to, but now it's for individual assignments as opposed to a daily gig. A daily, a daily deal. Um, but mo- I mean, and perhaps we, forgive me if I'm wrong, but like most of your life now is novel. Like you do a, a far fewer journalistic assignments. Yes. I, I, most of the time I make things up for a living. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Um, well, so t- to me, it seems, or like in my sort of role and life as a journalist, you know, the, the job of a journalist is toward timeliness, right? Something that's happening now. And and hopefully, and in like more long-form journalism, I think in the better journalism, there is um, sort of a, that that timeliness is a portal to talk about kind of time, you know, timelessness or, or you know, like um, lar- not just what happened yesterday or what's happening today, but, but, but how it's related to like a larger, you know, uh, history or a larger dynamic or whatever. But then 
then it's so the timeliness is like the role of the journalist and then the sort of timelessness this this ability to sort of be a story that is lasting seems to me to be a, a request or a requirement or, or or like a goal of the novel and you have done something you have created something that is both like incredibly timely in the sense that it is like speaking to uh events like spe speaking very closely to events of our contemporary era but but i believe you have written this and i think i'm very right that you have written this 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 um this novel for 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 human you know it, it is a novel about humankind and about being alive um and and about some of the oldest themes in 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 history which is like how to be a neighbor um and you know uh, general humanity and how we care and don't care for one another and and leaving which is also one of the oldest you know human 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 action. So I'm curious, like how you manage to balance that. Um, and if you ever found yourself slipping into the, the sort of journalistic mind of like, oh, this has to be, you know, of our of our moment. Yeah, so so the, one of the things that that sort of works against that in, in my particular way of doing things is that I spent years and years sort of thinking about the book before the years of researching the book before the relatively short period of actually writing the thing, and then the years of rewriting it because the first draft is so awful. And so it, it sort of stretches out the entire process um, to the point where, I mean, the, the, the sort of um, American War is an example, right? It's this book that I wrote that's very much a critique of sort of that post 9-11 um, pragmatic neoliberal kind of kind of mindset. And, and um but it ends up coming out four months into the Trump administration. And because it's set in this fictional second civil war, yeah. um, it's suddenly read as the first novel of the Trump era. I mean, literally there was an article that was just like, here are the first novels of the Trump era. And it was, you know, American war was <laughs> You're like, fine, you wrote it before, but okay. <laughs> yeah. Like I literally I finished it three weeks before he announced he was running for president. And, and so, you know, it's been great for my royalty statements. Uh, you know, that's that's fantastic. But in terms of what you intend the thing to be versus what the moment does to any reading of the book, mm -hmm. there's a chasm between those things. Yes. And so, you know, with this, with this novel, I was, one of the things I was really terrified of was that we would have, we would have a situation where for one reason or another, suddenly the world's attention would would turn back to 2015 and everybody would be focused on this and then it would be again great for the royalty statements great for the book sales but horrible for mm -hmm. the novel's life as a novel i um, mean these things have very long tails right all, all of my journalism is like immediate sharp spike the next day you get all the hate mail and then it's two days later you're done totally. and american war still sells like 100 or 200 copies you know a week it's just kind of like trickles along for, for a while. Uh, it never, it never did that well. It never like mm -hmm. sold, you know, hundreds of thousands of copies or anything like that, but it sort of continues to live. So I've become a little bit more comfortable with the sort of natural life cycle of novels versus the 10 years I spent in journalism, where it was just these like very short sugar high type <laughs> reactions to your work. Um, and I, I, I try my best to, to, uh, adapt this principle from architecture about how any architect who's designing something should give some thought as to how it's going to look as ruins. Yeah. And I, I try to think that way about, about the novels, we, you know, long after I'm dead, when they're just collecting dust on a, on a library shelf somewhere, what is, what are they carrying with them? Mm. What are they stripped of their moment? Um, and that's an abstract thought, right? Like that doesn't, it doesn't matter in any kind of commercial sense or anything like that. It's just something that I, that I think about because these things are going to, by definition, are going to outlive me. Mm. Um, I I wanted to ask about ruins. So I'm really glad you brought you brought it up. There is a, I mean, in in uh, in large part, you know, because of of where this the the sort of setting of the um, of the, the place where the shipwreck happens um, and sort of where the after takes place. Um, you have this, but 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 ruins is and and the sort of passage of time and the way time ravages people, the way time um, you know works over a place um, is 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 a thematic thread here that I find my found myself um, really. Uh, attuned to. Um, you have a, uh, there's on page 42, um, is it okay if I read from your book? Please. please. Okay, permission to read. Um, 
so this is this is um the uh vana am i saying her name right vana the little, the little girl yeah she likes to think that the house grows prettier as it ages like almost every other structure ever built on the island she imagined the house will look prettiest in ruins Around the back of the home sits an unused swimming pool, empty and lined with a rough fiberglass skin. The previous owners once told Vanna's grandparents that when the house was first built as a secluded getaway for some, for some distant descendants of colonial nobility, the pool was laid with a bed of crushed pink coral. If that had ever been true, it certainly wasn't by the time the Olsons moved in. As the years passed and their daughter met and married Yorgos Hermes and began a new life in the old white home, and after years of putting it off, the old couple finally opened the inn only to give up on it six months later. Whatever opulence lived in the house's past was confined there. Still, even though a hundred years have passed since it was made of stone and framed in the green of harborberry groves and adorned with a pool of pink coral, somehow it holds on to the memory of these things and in this way assumes a kind of inherited dignity unique to houses, even small ones, that begin life in the ownership of the rich. Whatever Vanna's grandparents used to speak of this place, or sorry, whenever Vanna's grandparents used to speak of this place, they inevitably slipped and began referring to all the grand things they were told it used to be. So I love this passage. I mean, it's definitely like very outside the plot of the book, but I feel like um, it gets to the heart of, 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 of the sort of, of the consciousness of the people who live in the after, you know, who are from the the the, the world of the after. Um, that is, you know, the, the people who have resided on this island at least for generations, if not, you know, a few generations, if not many more. Um, this idea of the sort of mythology of what once was, the possibilities of what could come, um, and and their own sort of sense of self, maybe not matching up to to, to what it is, like not wh where where the sort of distance between self perception. And I guess I wonder if you could speak to that the way these sort of mythologies, um, and also the kind of this idea of ruins this 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 um image or like light motif of ruins sort of struck you or, or or you worked with that thank you for that thank you thank you for taking on a paragraph full of run-on sentences that was oh like, my favorite was what run -on for breath on your behalf. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful um, uh it's um i i was thinking a little bit about the the um um the 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 correlation between a comfortable life and the extent to which you are able to reach into the past and the present um, and the future with, with all, all three are available to you. Whereas the more sort of agency is taken away from you and the more desperate you become, the more that narrows down into just the present. You're trying to shed your past. You don't have the luxury of assuming a future. You're you sort of, and so the people who are on the boat trying to get to this Island and all the before chapters are very much kind of, you know, narrowed into that space where it's the immediate there's no there's no sort of um there's no future there's no past whereas folks in this very privileged place can afford not only a past but can afford multiple pasts uh, other people's past past they never had any part of that sort of they can they can assume by virtue of having made a commercial purchase of having bought a house um you know and 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 so um, I was thinking a little in those terms. It's never sort of overtly stated in, in, in the book, but the island is very much Crete. It's based on Crete. Um, there's like an obscure reference to the cave in the center of the island where God was born, which is the Zeus myth, and you know that, that sort of thing. But but I was very intent on taking that landscape and turning it into a fantasy place. And mm -hmm. so there are there are no harbor berries. Harbor berries is the thing I made up. The, 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 the draft of the manuscript when it came back from the copy editor was full of these comments being like, are you sure? Like Cloudstone? I Googled it. There's no such thing like the, uh, for like all the flora and fauna because I, I had sort of made it up. Um, but I wanted a place with a very ancient past. Um, and there's a couple of points in the book where, where Vanna sort of walks by these places, the, the ancient parts of the island. Um, because I think that's that's another privilege, right? It's And it's not one that we consciously think about a lot. Everybody has a past. Everybody has a future. Well, not really. Not when right. you're when you're in the moment of survival, that all narrows down and you don't, you don't really have that privilege. It also strikes me as connected to, you know, in part what you what you read for us first tonight, this 
kind of notion that, oh, it's always been a certain way, or we've always been here, or our family has always been, you know, this this idea of always um, for, for people with stability um, is, is thrown around a lot. Um, and in fact, like, well, the truth of always is that people have been migrating forever, right? And the truth of always is it wasn't actually always your family here, because they had to be somewhere else before that, right? And so there's this kind of um, mythologized past that, 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 that sort of affords belonging to some and 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 thereby excluding it to others, which is so fascinating. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say that in, in that opening paragraph, there's one point somebody mentions uh, sort of like all the ships that have sh wrecked yes. on, on these shores and, and sort of like, they were ours. They were our, well, one of them is a, is a Higgins lander during the war. I don't know if the Greeks had a Higgins lander or not. Probably it was another sort of country's <laughs> name, but you know what I mean by us, yeah. right? Like that, that's sort of implied yeah. in, in the sense mm -hmm. of like, us is a very um, the, the the central privilege of us is that I get to shape it however I want. Yes. And so yes. Like, these aren't ours, but ours is whatever I need ours to be at any given. Yes. Moment. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was so I'm, I'm so glad that you um, brought up the I wanted to ask you about um, the sort of because there were sort of all these clues that like, yeah, this is Greece, but then like Yorgos Hermes, like very like Greek sounding, but then like Vana, you know, and Harbor Berries. And like, so I'm sort of I found myself being like, yeah, yeah we're in Greece. We're in, and actually, I was in Greece like two weeks ago. So I had just gotten back when I got this book. And it was like very um, affecting to, to, to read this book, having just been, you know, doing some like reporting there um, on Lesbos, actually. But um but, you know, so they're all enough clues that it's like, oh, yeah, that's where we are, the cliffs, the way the sea works, and then all of these sort of, um, yeah, like, uh, oh, no, that that couldn't be. And, and I love what you're saying about the sort of, fan yeah, could you, t I guess, could you talk a little bit more about um, making this a mythological place or making this sort of like a fairy tale place, um, especially when you've particularized, you know, Alexandria and you've particularized, you know, Homs and Syria, like all of these, not just Syria, but like the particular place names of these places. Yeah, it, it, the before chapters are, are hyper localized, yeah. and the after chapters are seen through this weird smudged lens of like I think I know where we are, um, but there's no such thing as you know the sun heads. That's not a real bird's. There's there's animals sort of marshalling through this through this landscape that don't exist, um, and that goes to to the structure of the book and again how it relates to the stories of the epigraph. I I mentioned earlier that the first four people to read it had four entirely different interpretations mm -hmm. of what was happening. And a lot, a lot of that broke down along the what's fantasy and what's real. Mm -hmm. um, and, and whether, I mean, I, I don't, I don't agree with much that any of my characters have ever said in any of my stories, but just the <laughs> sense of like, uh, I was thinking a little bit about, about the construction of the book as, as something that takes place at the collision of two fantasies two dueling mm -hmm. fantasies, mm -hmm. one being from folks on my side of the planet, the part of the world I grew up in, where a lot of people think if I just get to the West, mm -hmm. everything will be fine. If I just get there, everything, which in some cases, a lot of things will be fine, you know, but mm -hmm. but it is at its core a fantasy. And then the one headed in the other direction, which is all these people coming here are barbarians at the gate and we need to stop them at any cost, even if it means burning our whole civilization down, uh, whatever the cost to keep them out. And these people are stuck in this collision of these two fantasies and reality is subservient to both. What actually is happening does not matter in the slightest. What these people believe the world to be takes precedence over what the world is. Um, and then, and that, and for another reason that I can't go into too much without sort of wrecking the whole thing is why the after chapters aren't structured the, the, the way they are. Yeah. Yes. Um, so 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 beautifully put. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about. I mean, of course, we're in fairy tale land, and you and you talked about the sort of the Peter Pan sort of recasting, retelling of a Peter Pan story. But could you talk sort of even before you got there about what what um, your decision to have this through the eyes of two children, right? One of before of land of the before, and one of the the, the land of, belonging to the land of the after. Um, could you talk a little bit about what? Why children? Um, why was that important to you? Yeah, I mean, setting setting aside whether I do this properly at all, whether I can write children characters or not, or you know, the, the, you can the sort of mechanics. <laughs> thank you. The, the, the mechanics of, of the actual construction of it. I think I. I mean, the same thing was true of American War. I went back, and, you know, that starts with a child's perspective, and a lot of my short stories do that as well. Um, I think it has something to do with the idea that I think childhood is the time of our only real honest interaction with the world. Mm. Um, 
before we learn the conceits and obligations and camouflages of, of adulthood, um, compounded by just the, the uh, obligations of capitalism, of saying the right thing and not making trouble and doing the, you know, and all of that. Um, you strip that away and you get something that's a lot more honest. And since I, I, I'm, 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 I gravitate towards writing about what makes me angry and what makes me angry is usually, usually systemic um, institutional type of injustice. And, and when you filter that through the prism of a child, I think it exposes it in a much more jarring way. Um, and so I'm, I'm drawn to that place. Um, also, it just so happens that none of this sort of shows up in, in any kind of real sort of, a lot of my childhood is here, but not, not in the way that is, not in any kind of literal sense. So for example, these two children. So there's there's this child, Amir, who washes up on the shore. Mm-hmm. And there's this uh, 15, he's nine, she's, and Vanna is 15. Vanna lives on this island. He's, the boy is running away from, from the officers and the soldiers who are trying to detain him. And she sees him and she takes him in. That's sort of the first few pages of this book. Um, but then their interaction is a lot of sort of nonverbal stuff mm-hmm. because they don't speak the same language. She has no idea where he's from. He has no idea what's going on. Um, so I grew up in a place called Qatar. We left Egypt when I was five, and I, I grew up in this country called Qatar. And Qatar is only 10% Qatari. Um, 90% of the population came from somewhere else to cash in on the oil and gas money. And so as a child, you're constantly in these situations where you're doing this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're trying to figure out hand signals, and I, I'm, I'm eight, nine, you know, like that, that sort of thing, right? Um, and so that... I, I was thinking a lot about that when I was mm-hmm. when I was writing this. Um, but again, this is sort of sets aside whether whether I can write this properly or not. I'm just sort of drawn to that particular prism mm-hmm. of seeing the world because so much of the mm-hmm. way these injustices work is through a very well practiced art of lying. Mm-hmm. And if you can strip mm-hmm. that away through something as foundationally sort of truthful as childhood, you mm-hmm. you, you get at the thing, or at least I'm able to get at the yeah. thing a little better. So beautifully put. And one just small comment. I mean, I love um, the sort of kinetic nature of their interactions together um, and uh, just the sort of yearning to be able to communicate um, both in situations where they really need it, just like urgent for them to be able to understand each other. And other times where it's just like a manifestation of their childhood curiosity and and how you're able to move. And, and there's also um, one in particular, but a few like moment, one moment in particular I'm thinking of, of like profound humor where like the children move are in a stressful situation and move from a place of kind of pantomiming urgency and fear into a place of play and then back again. Um, and I just, this is not a question. It is just a fangirl comment of like, that was so well done. Um, and I admired that so much. Um, so I could keep commenting and running my mouth and asking, I have so many more questions, but I want to move to some um, reader questions here. Um, so one from Aya, um, I think, I, I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, and apologies if not. Can you tell us about how you chose distant and close third per- person point of view? Did you play with each and how did you find the process of chiseling away into such beautifully spare and concise prose? So, okay, so there's a question kind of about points of view and how you sort of landed on those. And then also just, yeah, how did you move? How did you do the work of, of chiseling away as she beautifully puts it into beautifully spare and concise prose? I thank you. I, I, uh, that's very, that's very kind. I, um, so this book went through about, I want to say, eight drafts. Um, American War went through 12, this went through eight, and this is about half as long as, as American War. Um, and I was I was changing things. I recently actually gave a workshop on, on sentences, and I, I the only the only manuscript that I had, like the only novel I had access to the early drafts of was mine. So I put up all eight opening paragraphs, you know, from each from each draft. Um, and it was it was generally sort of the same thing, except with these these minor changes. And every time I'd make a change, I'd screw up something else. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, I'd, I'd, I wanted more active. Okay, I'm going to present tense this, but then I the thing at the end is still past tense. You know, that, that kind of very technical line level screwing around. Um, I knew from the beginning that um, to make it work structurally, I couldn't first person it from anybody's point of view. Mm-hmm. and not move into a very sort of um, have that person be in some way all knowing, um, yeah. you know, like, especially like from the child's that. point of view. That's so tricky. Yeah, exactly. Which is, I mean, and again, one of the things this book does, which again, it doesn't do 
you know, a lot of the tricks in this book, and they're not good or bad, you know, I'm not saying they're genius level tricks or anything, but a lot of tricks in this book falls are sort of beneath the surface. And one of them is um, taking the structure of the book of Nicodemus, which is part of the Apocrypha, the books that never made the fight. And there's, there's one, there's one segment there about what happens to Jesus between the time when he dies and was resurrected. And I steal the entirety of that and, and sort of throw it in there. Anyway, none of this matters. I'm sorry, I'm rambling. Um, but no, I love that Easter get... egg. Now I know that that's a little Easter egg in there, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but so so there is, at, at a certain point, there is an all-knowingness that is imbued into one of the characters, but it's not, none of this is done overtly. This is all mm -hmm. me writing for myself. Um, at one point during one of the drafts I had interspersed between the chapters, I had monologues from the points of view of all the people on the boat, the central characters on this boat, they're explaining how they got there and, and sort of their, their backstories, which turned out to be a very helpful exercise for me personally, um, but didn't work structurally. It was just it was too many elements. It was too many cooks kind of thing. Um, so I took that all out. So at one point I had, I had sort of um, satisfied my urge to constantly slip back into the first person. I had managed to find a way to do that, but then it wasn't, it wasn't working. So I, I pulled all of that out. Um, there's this thing, uh, David Cheriandi, who's one of my favorite authors, he's, he's up in Canada, he wrote this book called Brother, which um, uh, in the introduction, um, the, the very kind way to put it is that American War was nominated for 10 awards. The more accurate way to put it is that American War lost 10. Actually, I think it was closer to 13. And one of one of those awards that it lost, very rightfully so, to a much better book was, was a book called Brother by David Cheriandi. And uh, he was talking about it, he was talking about how it kept getting shorter every time he edited it. And if he kept editing it, it would eventually sort of just disappear. <laughs> and I think at one point I was getting to that place where the book was just getting, getting shorter and shorter. And I got to a place where I thought, this says what it has to say and, and leave it, go away. Um, and that's, that's a really hard bullseye to hit. I rarely ever hit that. There's, there's probably a longer or shorter version of this book that's better, but you try to sort of ballpark where it's like, okay, I've, I've done the thing, let it go. Also, what a gift that you had that voice um, because I think it's so hard to access. Like, you know, you can just be in the mess of wondering, is this overwritten? Is it underwritten? What am I doing here? And, you know, and I agree, you've completely hit the bullseye here. Um, so we have another question about how you divide your time as a reader, your reading life um, between journalism or nonfiction and novels. Um, and there's sort of a sub question about how you see the sort of two forms evolving um, for both readers and writers. Um, oh, that's such a good question. I go all over the place. Uh, I'm very much sort of, um, some people are very sort of um, systematic, I think, about the reading. Like mm -hmm. they go through a particular canon or they go, I'm not that guy. I'm yeah. sort of the, the metaphor, the very bad metaphor is like wandering blind through a blindfolded through a furniture store and you're just looking for the comfortable thing. You sit down, <laughs> this isn't working. Uh, so I'm all over the place right now. I'm reading a book about the... Um, the divas of Cairo's 1920s entertainment scene and the nightlife of 1920s Cairo. It's just brilliant, like just, just very cool piece of research. Um, and uh, I, I move, I move from fiction to nonfiction pretty well. I'm a very slow reader. So I spend a lot of time with every one of these books. Um, when I'm in writing mode, when I'm actually writing something, particularly a longer piece, you know, a novel length, project, I veer away from other novels. Um, that's purely a function of insecurity. I don't need to see a better writer do the thing I'm trying to do. I, this doesn't, doesn't inspire me the way I think it inspires other, other authors. Um, I very much jump into poetry and I jump into nonfiction and, and poetry. I also listen to a lot of interviews and read a lot of interviews with writers about writing. I think every now and then you need that when you're in the valley and you're kind of like, you know, the novelty of the Premier project Rogue. is more novel. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I look for rope wherever I can find it and, and sort of, um, I, so that's what I'm doing when I'm, when I'm in the middle of the project is, is poetry and nonfiction. Um, that's all sets aside the, the research phase itself is just books I need to read for my project. And that's a very structured, that's when I become one of those people who has real sort of structure to their reading process. Outside of that, um, I'm all over the place and I have farm almost everything in the back shelf with the exception of my own damn books. Uh, I haven't read yet. I'm sort yeah. of, you know, I, I, I collect far more of these. I don't know. I, I assume you get this as well, where you just books kind of show up. Like they show up. 
and I buy them or someone gives them to me or someone sends them to me. And it is like, yeah, it is this dude, you know, you're just, you feel horrible all the time while also feeling in a space of like wild abundance of just being surrounded by all these books that you can't wait to read. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about the research process for here, for this book and how you, you know, kind of balance that? What, what, what did you feel like you had to read, um, uh, before and either particular books or even just like general things that you had to learn to write this book. And then what, what, if any, like kind of on the ground, I mean, it sounds like those, that, that, that anecdote you mentioned, um, with your friend in the Jeep in, in Egypt was, was, was certainly an instructive reporting moment. Um, other kind of moments or things you, you had to do or. Yeah. So, so, uh, first of all, yeah, thank you, Zara. That is Midnight in Cairo is the name of that book about, yeah. uh, about, uh, the divas of, of the 1920s. So cool, right? It's, it's usually when I read, when I read sort of Western academic histories of my part of the world, it's like, you know, the word terrorism shows up or the war, but you know, like it's, it's, you get used to a particular mode and this was just joy and people getting high and writing songs. And it was, it was it's, it's, a, it's a great little book. Uh, it's also incredibly well-researched. Anyway, um, I, I, a lot of, um, it's, it's sort of all over the place. There's there's stuff from my childhood, particularly almost everything that takes place in Egypt and Alexandria, and sort of that. All of that is stuff that I that I repurposed from my own childhood experiences, and then going back and forth between Qatar and Egypt. Um, and then there was the, the the stuff I saw when I was a journalist coming back years later, um, and seeing this place that that had obviously changed in a million different ways, and not changed in a million other ways. Um, so the residual sort of experiences of my journalism career, much as they shaped American War, also shaped this book. Then there was the, the the research that I think all of us do for all of our projects, which is just sit down in a room for months on end, reading everything you can get your hands on. Uh, and that was within that box. I was all over the place. So I read a history of Jam Barry and how he came to write Peter Pan, mm -hmm. and the really sort of the darkness that is at the roots of that story. His older brother died as a child in a skating accident and it crushed the family. His mom never got over it. One of the ways that his mom managed to get through the rest of her life was taking comfort in the idea that at least he would never grow old. And so you have the roots of Peter Pan as being something that's the exact opposite of what we think of, which is the man who refuses to stop acting like a child, Peter Pan syndrome, and a, you know, the sort of comforting fairy tale it has become. It's, it's the exact opposite. Um, and reading about his life and, and the sort of tragedy that, that followed mm -hmm. him and everyone involved with this project. Then there was research on the actual migrant passage as it exists right now. And there's there's immense works of, of um, detail of, of sort of what that looks like. And of course, I steal from that left, right and center. There's yeah. a segment near the beginning of the book where it becomes clear that the people who are on this boat had bought life ja jackets from smugglers and that these life jackets were uh, filled with foam. So they would do the exact opposite of what you would want them to do. If they, uh, All of that is real. All of that, you know, within the and, and, and how you deal with that is, is a. Is a, is a I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to steal in any kind of ethical matter from the real world and populate a, a, a piece of fiction. I don't know if I have the right to do it, I, I, you know, but, but it's, it's what you do when you write fiction, you, re, you research and you, and you sort yeah. of, you become a thief. Um, the book that influenced me the most uh, when I was writing this was a book called The Wandering Jews, uh, which was written about a hundred years ago. It was about, it's a piece of nonfiction uh, about Jews in Eastern Europe who were fleeing horrible persecution, trying to get to the Western end of the continent. Mm -hmm. And what happened once they got there? Well, they were, they faced all kinds of different persecution. Mm -hmm. And the details in that book sound like they were taken from a couple of years ago. It's, wow. it's, it's uncanny, the kind of, the, 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 the echoes. And so that, mm -hmm. that really shaped mm -hmm. uh, the, the title of the book is, is What Strange Paradise Comes from an Emma Lazarus poem. Uh, mm -hmm. Emma Lazarus is most famous for the, the New Colossus, the, the poem mm -hmm. on the Statue of Liberty. Um, but she was very much concerned with um, the plight of the Jewish people uh, around the turn mm -hmm. of the century. Mm -hmm. And she has this one poem, What Strange Paradise, that line comes from one of her worst poems. I don't, I don't, I don't like that poem, that it comes from <laughs> very much, but it's a beautiful line within that poem. Anyway, she has this other poem about uh, two Jews who escape Europe flee for their lives, end up in rural Texas of all places. Mm -hmm. And this poem basically is, is these two people sitting there saying, oh, thank God we made it. What the hell is this place? <laughs> like we know nothing of the cause, we know nothing of the people. We have no idea, we have no bearings, no. Um, 
and that, so the, all of that, all of that mm -hmm. influence, and, and uh, you put that all in the pod, and you churn, and you come out with this thing on the other end. That, that strikes me of like, look, look where we've ended up. It strikes me as that's connected to what you're sort of saying about, it, you know, being sort of so needing to be so twined um, and rooted in the present, um, you know, as, as a mechanism of survival. Um, I also just want to, one more question I want I want to end with, or I'll kind of combine um, these last two questions because they're very related, but, but just one thing, just a comment I wanted to make and just an appreciation is I love what you're saying. I'm teaching a, a couple classes on research. And what I love what you're saying about research is that it's not just this dutiful checklist of things you must learn, but more of this sort of, um, you know, wide net sort of hungry pursuit of, of just anything that will, will fill that well that goes into that pot. Um, so you're not just sort of like, okay, I need to learn about what happened between 2015 and 2021 in the Mediterranean, um, but, 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 but rather, you know, um, opening yourself up to all sorts of um, wide and, and strange and, and, and perhaps like not the most um, predictable in, in inspirations and source materials which is just really appreciate that. And I think that enriches your your work so much, or it's so evident in, in this beautiful thing you've created. Um, so so I'm sort of gonna combine, the last question, I'll just sort of combine these. Um, there's a there's a question about, uh, you know, the fact that you're, you're, you, read, you said those four, first four readers all interpreted it differently. Um, and so there's a question about whether their identity, nationality, uh, you know, race, ethnic identity, uh, played into, you know, sort of whether whether there was sort of some pattern there. Um, and then, there, you know, so the other question is about like, who was your intended audience in the first place? Um, and, and, and was there an evolution in that intended audience as you were writing the book? Oh, I have an answer for that first question too. Um, <laughs> I, w I will say this and I, I don't mean it. I don't, I don't mean it to be critical or, or you know anything like that? Um, with respect to to how hopeful a book this is, um, the most hopeful interpretations of what is happening in this book um, came predominantly from sort of white Westerners. Um, I take that for whatever it's worth, and also the sample size is so small that this could in, clearly just be sort of you know. Uh, anecdote as data kind of thing. And I, I don't want to give that impression. But I think that there is... A, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that it came from a really good place. I think the inter this particular interpretation of this book, including by somebody who blurbed the book. And I remember getting this blurb and reading it and thinking, what a generous, like, incredibly generous thing this person has done for me. But the book they're describing... <laughs> Is you know like I I don't know what to do with this right and and I, the, a version of this happened with American War where I thought I was yeah. writing one kind of book and then it, it's a bit, overwhelmingly it's been read as a different kind of book it's been read as an American book mm -hmm. um, I recently came across this YouTube video of someone who was like he doesn't know what Southerners are like this isn't you know and I was like yeah I I superimpose my people onto yours I'm sorry you know it's, uh, I went through a reverse on you I mean, yeah I mean it's, it's, I was I was trying to do something else entirely yeah. but it's read you know. And so a version of that has happened with this. And I, I used to be, I used to find that really jarring mm -hmm. and I don't anymore. I find it really comforting mm -hmm. um, because I'm not going to be around much longer to scream my interpretation from the rooftops. Like, this is what I meant. This is what, no, what you meant. And, you know, I fully yeah. subscribe to the idea that what you mean as a writer, what you intend as a writer does not matter in the slightest. What the reader takes from it is what it is. Um, so that was the kind of, that was the first thing that, that happened. Um, the, I, I didn't have an intended reader. I was in a weird place when I was writing this book. I was in a really sort of bad place just in terms of not knowing what the hell I was doing with my life and kind of, you know, just also American War was written when I had no publisher and no agent and no prospects of ever getting anything published, no book deal, nothing like that. And so there's a lot of, effort I didn't have to exert on useless things. Um, and with the second one, I that voice was in my brain of like, what if I, somebody loved the world building of American War and then you give them this and it's a very different kind of book and it's not future, it's now. And it's um, and I, I had to sort of set that aside. My first reader on all my projects is my best friend, Anna, who is a journalist up in Canada, who's a huge masochist. She's read the first drafts of all my novel length projects, <laughs> including the thoroughly unpublishable stuff that came before. Um, 
but I don't think of her as, as the person I'm writing to. I think of her as a person who's going to tell me why the first draft is shit. Uh, and she's very good at that. She's very good at outlining in very specific detailed terms why it's yeah. bad. Um, but I don't have, I, I, I don't have a reader in mind. I have people in mind who I hope will, who I respect, who I hope will like it, but I don't, I don't write for them. Whatever the thing ends up being at the end is what it is. May we all have an Anna in our lives um, to sort of lovingly, you know, set us in line. Um, I, we're, I know we're coming to the end and Carl's gonna come back in a second, but I guess I just wanted to leave it for you to sort of share anything else or any last words or um, sort of, you know, requests uh, for, for, for readers of this book um, to sort of be thinking about or considering or yeah, anything else you wanna share? I will reiterate my initial request that you pick up the Faraway Brothers, um, which is a fantastic piece of work. Um, I will reiterate my thanks. I know that this stuff is super thankless, and I, I really appreciate you doing it. Um, yeah, it's a weird thing to be putting out a book in the middle of a pandemic and, yeah. and uh, adjusting to all of this stuff, but um, to be able to shoot the shit with one of my favorite writers uh, mm -hmm. is amazing under any conditions. So thank you again for, for doing this. Sure. I could not, um, I could not agree more. I just, I'm such an admirer of you as sort of like a, a, a prose writer and a storyteller and a world builder and like an ethicist um, and a literary citizen. And I just like, this was such a delight. I was totally honored to be asked. Um, and um, yeah, so again, I will ha we'll have to hang soon um, because I have so many more questions for you. And in the spirit of like, yeah, it is in the middle of a pandemic still um and you know omar should be getting to go around the country and like meet people in person and like shake hands and sign books and um it sucks that <laughs> that's not able to to happen so buy his book and buy his book for your friends um or your family members um this is like a both both um an urgent and sort of timeless book and such an honor to have it in my hands thank you omar Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, dream interlocutor, you were just really kept us such a beautiful conversation. Omar, you're brilliant. And I could listen to you guys both talk all night. Um, I loved hearing about the writerly elements as well as you know the, the, the themes of the book itself. Um, so thank you both so much. I was absolutely blown away. Um, and to our wonderful audience for asking some excellent questions. I really hope that um, when we gather again, it can be in the store so that we can hang out in the signing line for a while and, um, and talk some more. But until that happens, I'm so glad we could join each other from our various places um, around the, the globe. And um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, definitely go ahead and, and pick up your copy of What Strange Paradise. Um, it's a great addition to your library. You will not regret it. So thank you so much, everyone. And have a good rest of your night. Thanks, everyone. Bye.